Morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, Morning. Well, welcome, warm welcome. I see we have been joined by some uh, visitors. Uh, I can see you, Rachel, you're very welcome. I know you're here for the um, uh, story in a moment, so we'll come to you shortly. And welcome also to Graham, one of our governors, I see who's joined us. And no doubt mm -hmm. we have others who we can't quite see on the screen, but um, you're all very welcome to this morning's meeting. Um, I'm just going to go to John um, to give us our usual reminder that we're recording the um, meeting, but also, John, if you'd be kind enough to give us any apologies. Uh, yes, yes, we've been recorded again, which we'll put on the uh, web later, but I've not had any apologies so far. All present and correct. Many yeah. thanks. Um, we have, um, you might have noticed, moved the normal declarations under the consent items. So the responsibility is on board members to advise in advance if there's been any change to the um, register of interest or any declarations in respect to the meeting. Um, but just to let you know that I haven't had any and in future um, everyone will know that we're handling it in that way. So on that note, um, I'm going to go straight across to the uh, board story. And uh, Krishna, if you'd like to introduce it, please. Yes, thank you, Helen. Just like to just do a brief introduction because I can see that Rachel is on the call. But essentially, this story is sort of really about privacy and dignity of our patients, and obviously being at the forefront of everything that we do. It's it's a good reminder to see um, what changes we can make on the back of um, some feedback from patients and some patient engagement. So, just like to introduce um, Rachel, just to go through the story and some of the um, actions that we've taken and that we're going to be taking forward. Morning all. Morning, Morning Rachel. The Apologies to the mask, I've got company. So. <laughs> um, so, I know you've all had the synopsis shared with you, um, so I won't go through every word of that, but just, um, I have had conversations with the patient involved, Mr M, and he is really engaged, really keen for me to share his story. We've had conversations, he's seen the synopsis himself as well, he's, you know, you know, he's quite happy with with what's in that. Um, I think one of the things he was really keen for me to, to get over as we go through is how um, anxious everything made him feel and how uncomfortable that was for him at the time as a patient. Um, so I, I'll talk through it. Um, but as I say, I won't go through it all in, in I won't read the synopsis out. But um, so he, as it says, he came in to ED early November. Um, he is clinically vulnerable to COVID-19. He was really, really anxious um, about coming into hospital and um, the paramedics, um, he says it took quite a while for them to convince him to actually come in because he was so anxious about it. And then he, they, he was given reassurance that actually it would likely just be a couple of blood tests and then he, he'd be out again. Um, so he looked at me and said, right, OK, I'll, I'll come into hospital then. Once he got to hospital, he said there, there was various weights, which he understood, but he said that each time he felt there was there was moving goalposts. So he was told, oh, well, you just need to have this blood test and then you'll be able to go. And then after he'd had that blood test, there was quite a wait. So he said, oh, no, you've just got to have this done and then you'll be able to go. So I think the constantly moving goalposts made him even more anxious because he, he's coming with this impression that he wouldn't be in long if he sorted to be on his way home. Um, and so the goalposts kept moving. Um, it moved to the point where eventually he was admitted up to EMU, which he wasn't expecting at all. He wasn't expecting to be admitted. Um, and um, there was, again, a wait on there to be seen by the doctors, waiting for blood test results, all those sorts of things. He eventually ended up staying until the next day um, and didn't go home until the next afternoon. Um, so he was he was really positive about the care he received. And he was really positive about when he raised his anxieties to staff, they were really reassuring and really did try to make him feel better. I think his big concern was the fact that if, if he'd known, if he'd had a clear idea of what the pathway was and what the possible outcomes were when he first came into hospital, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as anxious a time for him. It'd have been a lot more, he could have spoken to people and let them know that he may be staying in and all those sorts of things. Um, and and when, when I've had the conversation, the things he's, he's, he's suggested is that it'd be really good to have that information at the front door. So... Um, there's a few things I know previously we'd started working on some signage about the pathway and it's probably a very timely thing to do at the moment with the changes we are putting in around um, SDEC and, and um, the, the ways we're streaming patients 
um, to revisit that and look at do we have something on the front door that actually explains to patients these are the possible routes that your admission might take or you may be discharged home. Um, and actually, is there any kind of leaflets, is there any kind of information that we can share about the patient pathway? So it's something I've had a catch up with the patient experience team. We're going to start by looking at what we've got because we know we have got stuff out there. And is it a case of um, developing new information or is it looking at what we've got, making sure it's current, up to date, relaunching it, making sure it's available for patients? So that's something that's a work in progress. And, and me and Vicky Devlin have started um, having some conversations about that. Um, but as Krishna alluded to, one of the other things that he found really, really difficult when he was on ENU, not, he, he was really, really anxious about um, the risk of catching COVID, um, being extremely clinically vulnerable. Um, one of the things that happened whilst he was on ENU was um, the bay he was in was closed. Um, and when he asked the nurse why, they said all for infection control, which immediately shot his anxiety through the roof and he was really really concerned what was all that about he says again the nurse was brilliant when he asked she explained and reassured and all those sorts of things but um i think what he felt was lacking was some of that proactive communication so rather than waiting to ask he was sitting there getting more and more anxious and then having to ask the questions rather than people proactively giving him that information um and then his one of his other major concerns was um the next day when the consultants were doing their rounds how much information he could hear, so how much he could hear about other patients um, and how much um, patients could hear about him when he was when he was being seen by the doctors. Um, and we had some conversations um, about that. And um, one of the things that we talked about is patients having the opportunity to ask for private space if they want somewhere private to go and have those clinical conversations with their consultant or with, with the team that's looking after them, even with the nursing staff when they're doing their assessments. Um, and... I'd like to think that we'd always facilitate that. I think what we don't do is proactively offer it. And it's back to, again, letting patients know that that's an available option. So one of the things that um, Vicky and I talked about is having some posters so that staff, patients are aware that they have that option. If you want a private space to have a conversation, let us know and we'll do our best to facilitate it. I appreciate it won't always be easy, but actually where we can, let, let's do that if we can. Um, so we're looking at posters, we're looking at including that in some of the information um and um, mr Trevin was really pleased with that he, he thinks that's you know he was really keen to to be involved with that so um other things we've done we have asked him to um be a trust patient partner um he's um really keen to be involved really keen to be engaged he's, he's having a look at um what it involves i think he is still working he's got a job as well so obviously he needs to make sure he's got that the time available to support it um, so he has had the invite to do that and he's going to let us know about that. But he's really keen to be involved with all of this work that we're doing now to take forward um, improvements relating to some of the things he's he's described. Um, so I've promised I'll keep in touch with him. I've promised I'll keep him up to date. Um, so we had a conversation last week. We talked about the fact that I was coming today. We've shared the synopsis and things. He's really, really pleased that it is being raised and that we are sharing those stories. Um, when the first time I spoke to him, he did share, he said that he was extremely anxious about coming back to hospital and that potentially he may in future say, no, I'm, I'm not going. Um, and I shared with him how sad it was to hear that and that I hope that some of the work we could do could reassure him and, and get him to a point where he didn't feel like that anymore. So it's still a work in progress, but I think he really does feel that we have listened to him and that we are taking on board his his story. So, um. I won't, I won't say any more, just if anybody's got any questions around that. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, it's really um, impressive to hear such thoughtfulness going into um, the best possible patient experience at a time when there's so much pressure and no sense of we're all very busy and we're doing the best we can, but a real appetite to think about how even in these times we can adopt the very best practice. So. Um, Huge congratulations to you and the team on that. I'm sure um, colleagues will have thoughts and questions of Rachel. Um, Atul. Hi, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, for that. And as, as Helen said, I think it's, it's a very thoughtful kind of approach to that. I'm just thinking I had to call going to hospital here in Leicester uh, a few weeks back and there were others um, who are feeling a little bit kind of confused, if you like. So I think when you add uh, a, a language issue, perhaps, 
yeah. uh, or, or age to the mix and you suddenly find yourself in that kind of situation. And I just wondered whether, uh, you know, we're very successful in getting volunteers, you know, good old Luke at reception. It's always a, a, a wonder, I think. And whether that kind of approach might work in ED, uh, it may not, obviously, because of the nature of it, but where you've got people uh, uh, you know, taking some of the pressure off staff who are obviously uh, attending to, to, to important things, but they can help sort of, you know, um, uh, communicate, provide that reassurance and, and act as a kind of go-between, a uh, thoughtful go-between. So I just leave that as something yeah. to think about. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sashal. Um, Berenice. Thanks, Helen. And and thanks, Rachel, for, for going through the, the story. I think I'm sure you'll feel a bit uh, like myself that slightly disappointed that this had to be brought to light because there's a lot of themes in here that that we'll probably feel we've addressed time and time again um, and, and are still reoccurring. So I, th I think it is that bit about what can we do to ensure that um, this doesn't continue and these don't crop up as, yeah. as kind of ongoing themes, really, um, because I know you're doing a huge amount of work in the division to try and reinsure people and make sure that they, they understand their pathways. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Uh, very good. Um, well, we're very grateful to you, Rachel, not only for um, showing the leadership you are on this agenda, but also for taking the time to come and share it with us. It's really important well, we're kept in the loop. Um, I've seen another hand up from Mike. So we're just going to hear a last word from Mike before we release you onto your day, Rachel. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Uh, it's probably it's a question I should probably know the answer to, but it reminded me when, when I was in hospital many years ago, I, I could hear every word that was being yeah. said to the people in the beds around me. And obviously they could hear what was being said to me. And I just wondered in this in this age of GDPR and data protection and stuff, whether there's any legislation or whether we're mandated to, to not let that happen. I, I, I feel I ought to know the answer to that. But I, I know practically it's, it must be very, very difficult because of the size and the location of wards. But is there a are we breaking any rules or any laws by by letting people in next beds hear what's wrong with me or hear, letting me hear what's wrong with them? Um, my understanding is I'm not aware of any specific legislation, but I mean, it's something I, I could um, look into. It's, there's nothing I'm aware of, but I think really it's about best practice and thinking about the patient's privacy and dignity. And I think we should be doing that, shouldn't we? So, yeah, no, please don't go away and do any work on my behalf. Uh, I was just curious to know whether that whether there was kind of a a law if you like uh, you know a yeah. gdp john do you know I, i'm not expecting you to but is, is there anything in the cosec stuff that you know the governance stuff that talks about that uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anything because i think there's <coughs> obviously the issue of practicality yeah but i guess there's there's a balance because mm. there's yeah. one thing having a, a general consultation and there's perhaps something else having a more detailed conversation yeah. so mm. yeah okay thanks I think we're probably better at that. I think where it's breaking bad news or where it's something that's, you know, um, like say a really significant conversation, um, we are much better off in that private facility. I think it's the day to day stuff where we don't. And actually, it was really clear to Mr. M that it was really important to him that he, he should have been offered that opportunity to have the conversations in private and that we should be doing it for our patients. So I think we need to stop thinking about it as, as the exception and start thinking about it as the rule, if that makes sense. And thank you for that. And a lovely comment from Hala in the um, chat um, about ignore, um, acknowledging the work of the complaints team and the fact that the gentleman was happy to pay for the posters is a real, it's a, it's yeah. a literal example of a, of a complaint being a gift. Yeah. Um, um, but only a gift because he was generous enough to give us the feedback and you were so proactive and thoughtful in how you received it. Um, so thanks again, Rachel, and um, yeah. good to see you. Thank you all. Take care. Bye bye now. So we're just going to move through now, if we may, please, to the next item, which is the report from the chief exec. Uh, we've had your report, Angie, but I'm sure you'll have um, some up to the minute context to add. Thanks, Helen. And yeah, just three points of that um, up to minute context and, and guide us through the agenda later. Um, I think that my reflection firstly, uh, a real mix at the moment for all of us at work and out of work around positivity 
and still huge challenges. Um, so the positives uh, today, we've fought 58 patients COVID positive in our hospital beds, which if you think when we um, met as a board last time in January, um, we, we got up to almost 200 at one stage. So really positive in seeing those COVID patient uh, numbers come down. Um, some real uh, energy and positivity around the vaccine program. And thank you to um, people on this call and um, in our teams for, for the hospital hub work that we've started again this week for second vaccines and our primary care staff um, supporting that huge effort uh, across Derbyshire to, to deliver vaccines and Derbyshire doing really well on, on that front. Um, I hope you all saw uh, us on the news. We made national news for our research um, work. Uh, lots of research going on, but that one in particular, really positive to see the team getting the recognition they deserve. And you'll see later on the agenda, a huge amount of transformation work happening uh, within the organisation and importantly for me across the whole system uh, to improve the care for our population. Balance with that, the challenges, we still have eight patients this morning in our ITU who are COVID positive. Um, and, and that's with seven non-COVID in ITU as well. So that, that real challenge of um, supporting uh, those patients and our staff who, um, as we all know, have, have really been through some uh, difficult times at the front line and will continue to, to do so for coming days and weeks. Um, sadly, we um, passed the over 400 death mark um, for our, our patients recently. So our thoughts with all the families and friends of those patients who've lost lives through COVID and, and particularly as you all know um, a really heartfelt um, thank you and um, thoughts with Jenny Stone, his colleagues and family um, who we lost sadly uh, this month. Um, we know that we're being asked to look at a potential uh, for a COVID surge again so although there's that optimism there um, we can't take our, our foot off the gas and we need to continue to prepare and be flexible um, and we have huge numbers of patients on our waiting list um, that we, we need to support and the logistics of actually trying to get um, uh, the operations running again uh, is, is huge. So thank you to the team for that. Um, first and foremost for all of us is the health and well-being of our staff. We can't do any of this um, without them as we know and that balance for them um, day to day uh, in supporting them is really important. And I know Jeremy and Zoe will, uh, will touch on that when uh, we get feedback from People Committee. Um, we're continuing to make sure we um, deliver the best possible quality of care for our patients. And there's some work specifically we're doing around those on, on waiting lists, which again, um, we'll pick up later uh, through Quality Committee report from Jane, Krishna and Hal. And that continued focus on IPC, we really mustn't lose sight of. Um, we are starting to increase um, uh, particularly our surgical services. And I know Alison and Berenice will pick up um, the, the restoration element of uh, our work and particularly the focus we've had on um, priority surgery across the system this last uh, few days. Um, and the other area then that uh, uh, we can't not uh, comment on um, is the white paper uh, and the challenges that um, and opportunities that that, that, that presents. Uh, I started with challenges because Lee, I was just thinking about uh, uh, the, the world of finance and planning and uh, the work that you're doing with Berenice and the teams to try and um, do an annual business plan in the context of not understanding um, the financial position. Uh, we were told yesterday that we'll get some clarity for next year around the 25th of March when it's NHSEI's board, uh, which given the next financial year starts on the 1st of April is going to be um, a real challenge. Uh, so some um, ongoing work around what does the transition from where we've been to where we go in the future mean for us all. I think the positive around some of the white paper thinking uh, for us in Derbyshire is that it is uh, in line with our thinking as, as an ICS and the work that we've been doing um, and the governance uh, structure and framework for our ICS is starting to really take shape now so um, that's a positive. Uh, and I'll just introduce our strategy that we will pick up later on the agenda uh, by reminding colleagues that uh, Kathy McLean, Chair of UHDB, is joining us for that item. And apologies from Gavin, who's um, taking some uh, leave this week. But um, looking forward to that discussion around uh, where we're going and the direction of travel for our organisation. I'll pause there, Helen, and happy to take any um, specific questions on the report.
um, as we go through the agenda. Many thanks, Angie, um, for those um, comments and indeed for the report and indeed for the volume of work it represents um, that's taken place in the Trust since the last time we met as a board. Um, any comments or questions for Angie? No, I think Angie, all very clear, victim of your own success. Um, very clear and, um, as I say, very impressive. So uh, thank you to you and to the team for um, all you've uh, achieved. Um, and we look forward to the strategy discussion uh, shortly. Um, so that brings us on, if we may, to the um, uh, next section on learning improvement and innovation. And uh, we're at that time of year when it's time for the annual report from the Royal Academy of Improvement. Um, and I hope and understand that Maria Riley is joining us for this item. Are you with us, Maria? Um, I was presenting it on behalf of Maria. I ah, don't think she's joining. Is she not? That's no. fine. Um, thank you very much, Berenice. Thank you. And it, it, it honestly is a real pleasure to be able to, um, to, to present this item to the board today, um, our improvement journey 2021. It's, it's certainly been a, an, an interesting year for everybody and to, to see reports such as this, um, include, including so much information and so much in, in innovation and transformation, um, is, is absolutely excellent. Um, the, obviously, the Royal Academy started a couple of years ago. This is year two, um, and there was certainly very robust plans around uh, to to get us through the the, the second year and train a, a number of people um, in CUSA and certainly the practitioner course, um, and also uh, taking on board listening into action to to kind of plan out our developments uh, for the year. Um, COVID's obviously hit us, and 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 as improvement academies do they uh, react and respond and have been able to support us throughout uh, the this period maria wanted to apologize and say um, she wanted a lot more information in this report. Um, she felt that uh, there was a lot, lot of information and um, examples of what had happened within the divisions that we weren't able to capture um, that, that because, that because the uh, divisions are working so hard responding to COVID. Um, I myself have think that she's captured a huge amount of work uh, and I think it's very, very impressive the amount of examples that have been given. I think it's really positive that we've actually got a, around 100 fully accredited CUSA practitioners um, and there's also about the same number that have been through the one day program and um, we're about we're in March we we restart our program there's been a lot of work done and um, to do as much as we can virtually so across March and April we'll be able to uh, start moving uh, towards that. Um, the team supported our planning and uh, development session that we had for the Leadership Academy yesterday. Uh, there, there was um, presentations from each of the divisions where they were able to provide us their thoughts and their priorities very much linked to our new strategy moving forward, uh, which was excellent to see, um, and examples of what they've been able to identify through COVID, what they'll be able to build on. So making sure that we don't lose that that really good practice. I think it's really important to say that, that although the Leadership Academy is in place, this is more about a, a methodology and a culture within the organisation. So that there are a team of people that, that absolutely support on specific projects. But what we've seen is because of this methodology, people across the divisions are just getting on and doing it, which is part of the phrase that they, they re include within the report. Um, and I just picked out one. I know people have read the report because I've already had some feedback on it. Um, but one for me just was on the, the Robinson Ward hot topics. It was really good to hear from Donna Calladine, Robinson 
Robinson ward matron. Um, Ten weeks into her role on Robinson as a ward matron and she noticed the communication wasn't good as it could be and the information wasn't real time. I wanted something visual for the staff and created a dashboard as per picture and that made a real difference on the ward and we've had some really excellent feedback. So simple idea and she didn't ask permission, she just got on and did it. She learned from it, it she's imp been improving it. Unfortunately, we moved our ward, so she's going to have to get it all put back together again. But uh, but it w I just wanted to pick that out as a as a as an example. The other bit, just to mention, is what what is really fantastic is um, how we are really linking with partners. So the charity, the research elements, the joined up care Derbyshire. It's really helping inform and some of that system work and that's coming out quite strongly from the from the white paper and links to universities as well and just finally just to acknowledge um, the amount of work that has been ongoing they've been involved with all the virtual clinic work there's the prescribing pathway the urgent care pathway they've been really helping support develop that further and the planned care pathway amongst a, a, a host of other things so just a, a massive thanks to the team and the organization because it's everybody who's involved in it Thanks. Any questions, Helen? Thanks, Berenice. And you've done great justice to that report. Um, and it's, uh, as you say, really, really impressive. It would be really impressive at any time, let alone in the middle of our response to COVID. Um, and nice applause I see going on screen. Um, Sue. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, and thanks, Berenice. That was a, a great summary of it. Um, and really just to echo that, um, I think what's what's great to see is that it, there's such a clear, um, if you think about the three bits, as I see it, of our our staff, our patients and the system that we work in, it's, I think that there's a real um, focus on all three of those elements. And I think yeah. it's great to see them playing across all three with such influence, you know, and the work that, that the guys are doing, as you say, across all the pathways. Um, you know, with, with with UHDB and the lead that we're playing and uh, on the um, the PIFU stuff. Um, so I thought the report was smashing, and I agree. Maria probably needs to give herself a bit of a break. Um, and the other thing, just to say, was uh, Krishna and I did um, a, a visit to the team. I, I was on the other end of an iPad, so it was a different experience. But I was really pleased to have done it. And, and the two words that were bouncing out of that session for me from the team were pride and passion. Um, really proud of what they've been doing, but absolutely no let up, uh, passionate about what's next, what's next, what's next, how do we make sure we don't go back, you know, how do we make sure we capitalise on what we've learned and ask from the board to make sure we support that and we drive that message that yeah. says, you know, we weren't just doing that because of COVID, this is the way that we need to work. Um, so I was really, really encouraged by that session, clearly some very talented people. Um, but if we were worried at all about, you know, people thinking, oh, we can go back to normal, you don't get don't get any of that sense from that team at all. It's onwards, onwards. Let's keep improving and developing. Uh, so just wanted to say thank you to to the team for that, um, because I think it's a huge, huge asset to this organisation. And um, I don't think we need to worry about sweating that asset. I think they'll want to do a lot of that themselves. So thank you. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. Um, Beverly, please. Thank you, Helen. Really, Sue, Sue said it all, but at the beginning of COVID, the one thing board said was, can we learn from this? And can we make sure that the lessons we've learned continue? It's not just a, a you know, a, a quick reaction to, to, a, to a huge challenge that the trust and the staff have gone through. And I'd also like to say, I think the visual presentation is fantastic. Mm. It's colourful, it's clear, it's positive. It's just a real feel-good factor when you read the report. What a shame Maria isn't here to hear all the accolades. I'm sure they'll reach her, um, but thank you for that, Beverly. Um, Atul, please. Thank you. Um, and I, I'd just like to add two more bits of kudos, I think, uh, by way of observation. First, it's really great that uh, a lot of the work has been recognised as best practice by NHSEI. So I think, you know, looking outwards and, and uh, what people have said about external networks and so on, that's, I think, a, a really good thing. And the second thing is, I know I've only been uh, with, uh, with the hospital for two years, but this has been a consistently high-performing kind of team. 
uh, an issue. And I think it says a lot about the culture that's been embedded very positively to try and seek to improve. And I'm sure it will add a, a, a hell of a lot to, to becoming outstanding in terms of uh, inspection and other things. Uh, but it's not just a sort of flash in the pan. Uh, and that's really good to know that there's that kind of sustained uh, uh, performance uh, uh, and, and, and outputs coming out from this. So uh, great, great to see that. Thank you, Atul. Uh, Lee? A, a bit of a how far we've come point and then a how much further we've got to go reflecting possibly. It, it, it doesn't feel that long ago to me, but it, it might predate you at all. We were having a conversation at board that was slightly flim flamming about going, well, what's our improvement methodology around here? And how do we kind of harness that with the observation that high performing healthcare organisations have an identified improvement methodology? If you kind of look at the report about the penetration we've got into the organisation, about the training through that programme and what we've now got, it, it is a big cultural change programme we've got. So I think that's enormously positive my kind of further to go point relates to if we have a hypothesis that our larger improvement opportunities in the health and care system lie across organizational boundaries we do have a kind of emergent and actually quite firm architecture for doing that in the system space but there is quite a lot more work to do for next year particularly noting beleaguered workforce covid how we get that balance right to go what are the improvement activities for next year that we all focus on in the health and care system that will make us more clinically and cost effective? So I think it's a fantastic report and it's it, it's reaches beyond this organisation, which is fantastic. But there's quite a lot more work to do to galvanise around what are the precise improvement opportunities into next year that will keep us clinically and economically safe. So there's loads more to do, but it's a great report and it's a great piece of work. Uh, beautifully put um, and indeed joining the dots between Atul's comment about the contribution of this um, to our aspirations about being recognised as outstanding in this regard and the importance of it being embedded. So uh, really helpful uh, comments. Thank you. Um, and again, a huge, uh, huge thanks to uh, Maria and the team, which I know you'll pass on, Berenice. Um, I'd like, if we may, to welcome Cathy McLean to the meeting. Cathy's um, the chair at UHTB and Cathy and her chief executive, Gavin, and myself and Angie have been working closely together in the preparation of our strategies uh, because it's time for both organisations to have a strategy refresh, but obviously in the context of system working, um, it's really important that the two acutes in our system are uh, working hand in glove to make sure that our approach is complementary. Um, so as we discuss our strategy today, Cathy has very kindly agreed to be with us. So I'm going to suggest that we just jump over a couple of agenda items and go straight to item seven, which is our Together as One, our trust strategy. And we'll take that item now and then that will give Cathy the luxury of deciding whether or not she's got time to stay with us. And of course, you'd be most welcome for any of the other items, Cathy. But similarly, we'll be able to excuse you should you have them um, uh, pressing matters at your own trust. Um, so if I could go straight across to you, Angie, for item seven, please, together as one. Thanks, Helen, and morning, Cathy. Um, and Cathy and I were having a discussion yesterday around um, our roles as um, uh, Chair and Accountable Officer for the Quality Committee across Joined Up Care Derbyshire, which I think very timely in terms of um, our strategy and some of the conversations this morning about how um, far we're progressing working as a system now um, and our strategy being set uh, as part of the, the joined up care. Um, as Helen always describes it, we are one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, um, but we need our, our clear boundaries and definition, but being part of that, that system is, is um, obviously very important. Um, and just a couple of points from me. Um, people have uh, stolen my thunder again because they've mentioned the leadership assembly a number of times uh, but we had 70 of us on it yesterday which i think is um, amazing in itself given the pressures everyone's still still under and um, to have so many enthusiastic um, members of staff and they were fabulous um and and there was a couple of points that really stood out for me 
um, one that one of the divisions had got a care unit who has carefully mapped each of the five strategic priorities through to their own care unit and what they're going to do to make sure that we as an organisation can deliver on that strategic priority, um, which I just thought is fabulous. Um, and uh, the other comment was um, just to, for those observant amongst you, um, Sarah and I deliberately left a typo in um, to make sure that you'd all read every single page. Um, actually, Sarah and I went blind and hadn't spotted the typo, but on page 29, I do quite like having an ooh strategy um, instead of an on. So, um, but one of the uh, team yesterday had, had pointed that out. Um, and, and I say that slightly tongue in cheek, but actually for me, we can't have a strategy that um, in some organisations sits on a shelf and no one knows what on earth it means um, or is the, the doorstop. Uh, and just some examples there of people really are using this already. Um, and the other uh, comment I picked up yesterday from um, a member of staff who uh, it surprised me when it, I heard it was from them in a positive way um, that they said it's really good our organisation has got a, a direction of travel that's very clear and we all know what we need to, to do to contribute to that. The challenge now is getting on with it. Um, so again, some real reflection of this is a, a live document. Um, I did stick with the five years. We had that debate last time about how many years do you make a strategy? Um, for me, partly, we've we've come so far with it, um, and it's got the five uh, strategic priorities. So for people to simply remember the number five is, is a bit of that consistency. Um, but also that Joined Up Care Derbyshire's review happens before ours, so we can always bring it forward. And has been part of a system, I think, in um, three to four years' time when Joined Up Care Derbyshire's strategy is being reviewed, I'm sure we will be thinking very differently even to now as how we work as, as an organisation. So they were just my reflections. We've discussed this a number of times. If anyone else has spotted a typo, I, I might cry, but I will um, correct it. Um, uh, but happy to take any final comments and, and thoughts from colleagues and, and Cathy, grateful for your input too. Yeah, thank you, Angie. I wonder, Cathy, if I might come to you in the first instance for any thoughts or observations you have, which I'm sure colleagues will be pleased to hear, and um, and then we'll open it up more widely. Well, thanks, Helen, um, and thanks, Angie. Um, and I, I think simply the fact that you've invited me today is is fantastic, actually, because that shows that um, you know we're we're all willing to work together and, and trying to increasingly do so. So I think that's absolutely brilliant and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, so I, I really liked this. I thought it was um, I, I thought it was really well positioned within the system. Um, you've got clarity about you know how this sits within the the joined up care Derbyshire. Um, and I think your focus on being an anchor organization as well. Uh, was really important because um, you know as a within within the region within the system within Chesterfield you are huge uh, employer and so on and so forth and that really really makes a, a difference and I think we're all having to think much more about how do we link up with other organizations in our role as an anchor but you make that really really clear um, you know I think all your your, your values and your your clarity about what you're trying to achieve is is great. I guess that the thing that will will then turn this into reality is chunking it up into what will you do by when, um, and what's the delivery plan that follows from this, and how you'll track it as a board. And I say that because we've been in our own in in UHDB, we've been through going through exactly the same journey. Um, uh, and Krishna, uh, who not that long ago was at UHDB, will know that too is that it's actually what are you going to um, say that you can really do in a year. Otherwise, I think, as you referenced, um, these things can sit on shelves and everybody remembers fondly that they created a wonderful strategy, but there it was sort of thing. And actually, if you if you constantly review in the board and other places, you know, where are we up to? What are those small number of measurables that show we're making progress? And I think the dynamic element of it, you've already referred to, um, you know, if we'd been writing these five years ago, look how the world has changed. Uh, now we've had uh, an advancement of system working, we've had COVID and so on, we'd be refreshing it. And I think the word dynamic is important. I'm sure we'll all have to 
refresh these as we go along. Um, and you could argue, why have trusts got strategies at all now? We're part of a system. But I think in, in discussions with yourselves and ourselves, I think we, we all agree, actually, we do need that within. It needs to be locked uh, in lockstep with the system. But we absolutely do need them because we, we have a lot of things we need to deliver um, as part of that system. So I, I have got no... Uh, no things that I think you haven't done or anything. It's not for me to say that, but I, I was truly impressed at the, the the system sense of it. You've got that up front and centre, um, and and I think that's that's brilliant. And I think we'll be really pleased to work, uh, you know, in partnership with you, in whatever both organisations can do together. Uh, that would be brilliant um, because we're all focused on our population. Uh, we none of us own our population, but we serve our population. And if we can do that together as part of the wider system, I think that would be uh, in the best interests of, of uh, our population, citizens, patients, however they are on any one particular day. So that's all I would say at this stage. But thank you thank very much you, for Kathy. giving me the chance. Yeah, it's super. It's really good to have you around the table for this important debate. And, and thank you for making the time to do it. Um, and, you know, I very much uh, concur with the view of the importance of each organisation having a strategy because any system is only as strong as its weakest link. Um, so, you know, that real clarity of all of our respective contributions to the strategy is uh, more important than ever. So it's been a pleasure for us to kind of crack on with this and to be able to work so closely with you in doing so. Um, I'd like to also pick up your point, Cathy, about, you know, how are we going to make it happen and how are we going to know whether or not it's happened and how are we going to publicly hold ourselves to account in a transparent way around all of that. Um, so we're going to open up the discussion now in the context of uh, Angie and I, I think, having resolved um, that we are asking the board today not to approve this as the final strategy, but to approve it for consultation. And that consultation, both in the organisation and with our partners, will allow us to um, understand what the offer from our divisions and different parts of the trust and partners are so that we can set out clear milestones on the trajectory to delivering the outcomes that are so clearly articulated in the strategy. So it's really important that they're clearly articulated in the strategy. I think we're all probably content that they are. But um, I think we will be loath to see the final strategy not set those out. And of course, the detail of how those um, uh, milestones that are relevant at the strategy level are um, delivered in, you know, in a step by step approach will sit in a series of complementary strategies, whether that's the enable, uh, whether that's the quality strategy or the people strategy or the digital strategy. But also this process we're about to go through now of having that consultation will allow all of those key players to be thinking in parallel about the detailed planning that will support the milestones that we will set out in the strategy before we put it to bed as a final strategy. So um, so that is the proposal that's coming to board today um, in that regard. So um, I'll go in the first instance to Angie, please. Thanks, Helen. It was just a reminder that you and Cathy have, have given me. Um, I was so enthused about Leadership Assembly's ownership of it all yesterday that that was the um, task we gave them to, to go through. They, they've done some thinking, but there's some work to do around the measurables. Um, so we're aiming to get that done um, and ready for May. Very good. Um, so does that mean we, we're likely to have the final version back for sign off a board in May, Angie, or will that be subsequent to that? Um, I want to reserve judgment, if that's OK, okay on the um, timing of the planning information centrally because it's the annual plans that will will give us those standards and if that's not out till the end of March um, we'll aim for May but I always have to remember boards early in May now not late isn't it um, but given that uh, we haven't got a public one till July um, I, I don't want to put Berenice and Lee and all the teams on the spot but we'll do our best. Well, all we'll hold you to is giving us a firm date when we have the May meeting um, if it's not May. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Jeremy, please. Thank you, Helen, and th thank you, Angie, for this. Uh, I, I think it's, it's really good. I think it's come on a long way, and it look, it's looking great at the moment. 
Um, just a couple of comments. One is, um, as Helen said, it's, it, well, I'm looking forward to seeing the measurables that go with it in terms of the delivery. But the other thing is, on page 30, it refers to the strategy framework, and there's reference there to the um, ICS having its own strategy. And to be honest, if I ever knew that the ICS had a strategy, I'd forgotten it. And I just wonder whether it wouldn't be worth perhaps putting in a few sentences to say what the ICS's strategy is and how this fits into it. It's really sort of picking up the point that, that Kathy was making about the way it fits into the, the wider system, because um, that reference to the ICS strategy is a bit tantalising. You think, oh yeah, it fits into it, but what, what does the ICS strategy say? So perhaps in the in the final, final version, there might be a sentence or two about that. Can I come back on that one, Helen? Is that OK? Of course. Um, <laughs> and without getting really pedantic about this, there's, there's something about a strategy and something about a plan. Um, and, and I did exactly what um, you asked there, Jeremy, and went to the ICS strategy. Um, and it actually, then when you get underneath it, it is a plan. Um, and it is pages and pages uh, that Cathy and I were talking about yesterday. There's something about um, a strategic direction that gives you a focus. Um, but enough flexibility to have an annual planning round to support it um, versus trying to do absolutely everything and set so many targets that we never achieve anything. Um, so I suppose the ICS strategy is the triple or the quadruple aim and, and I'm just thinking maybe it'd be worth putting that in to, for clarity. Um, but if you, if you go to look for the ICS strategy, all you get is a plan and I say it is pages and pages of such detail that is already out of date when I looked at it, um, you, you wouldn't believe. So an, an interesting conundrum, I haven't got the perfect answer, but um, uh, I, I was with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Jane, please. Um, thank you, Andrew, for incorporating all the comments from last uh, board meeting. I think that's, that's really helpful that you've done that. I, I wanted to just say something really positive about the kind of maturity of divisional governance. We've, we've already heard this morning about the care units already taking ownership of this document. And I think that's really important. So we've done a great, great job on consulting with lots of people to try and get ownership of it. But now we're going to get real ownership of the deliverables because we've already seen it demonstrated today that people are already using the document and are thinking about what those key metrics, what those quality improvement focuses need to be that underpin that strategy. So I just want to be really positive about that. I feel it's a document that is really um, kind of uh, energised our staff and it is actually going to be owned and that's actually the, heel, the whole key, isn't it, to actually delivering that quality improvement. So so well done, because I think that next step, we've already made a good, a good step forward on that already. So thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Lee? I, I, I just wanted to reiterate, I think it's in really good shape in terms of a definition of what CRH is about and where we're headed next. And I think the approval for consultation idea is a really good idea, just in the context of trying to garner some opinion of in terms of those year one deliverables, what do our wider stakeholders think we should be prioritising? And then just, I guess, then, Helen, there's just a little bit of a tension, isn't there, around what do the year one smartened up objectives mean in the context of a system first planning round, where candidly we wouldn't want to kind of do that in advance of everybody else because it could be perceived as here's a unilateral view from predominantly the hospital sector about what we're doing and just how we dock this in the national planning timetable. So I think it's in good shape. I think the approval for consultation is a good idea. I think to answer Jeremy's point, we could just share the ICS application, which I think it isn't perfect, but it's quite a good definition of what is joined up care Derbyshire about, which I think this supports and supplements. Then we just got to manage that tension around system first, wider stakeholder engagement, and just how we dock this into the national planning round, which is still a little bit murky. That's helpful um, uh, description of all the moving parts there, Lee, so thank you. Um, in the absence of any further hands, I'm going to suggest, therefore, that we um, approve the strategy for consultation and that we have um, a further discussion at the May meeting of the board, either to approve the final strategy or to have an update on where we are in setting out uh, some of the uh, metrics and milestones. 
Um, so I think we'll leave that item there. And thanks again, Angie and uh, uh, Sarah, for all the uh, hard work on this. It's uh, looking really good. Um, and thank you, Cathy, for being with us. Much appreciated. You're obviously very welcome to stay and we shan't be at all insulted if you need to go. Um, I, I will go, Helen. Thank you very much. That's uh, really good to hear. And thank you for inviting me. I'll uh, see you. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you again. Bye. Bye, Cathy. Bye. So I'm just going to bring us back now, if we may, to the um, natural flow of the agenda, which is item five, the well-led developmental review, please, Angie. Thank you. And just um, two things to add to the, the document. One, that we had a, a well-led um, so discussion with uh, the CQC last week. They um, only wanted to talk to myself, Hal and Krishna, um, and it was an hour. Um, Lisa uh, H had done a fab job of collating the information together, which I shared with you all. Um, so it was under the well-led questions and domains. Um, and uh, Hal and Krishna did a fabulous job too of bringing that to life in the discussion. Um, we've no idea what this means in terms of um, uh, going forwards, next steps. Um, it, it's all change in early days with uh, CQC and, and well-led reviews at the moment. So it was just to place that in the context of this paper. Um, and also um, Helen, um, quite rightly, has challenged the system in terms of, uh, again, let's not do this individually, organisationally. Um, how do we look at well-led across the whole system? Um, and Mr. Hancock's caught up with UIC uh, yesterday, Helen, on the HSJ uh, headline around CQC inspections for ICSs. Um, so uh, just to note the paper in terms of where we're at, and I wasn't sure, Helen, whether there was any further feedback from system colleagues through, through the chairs that you've had around um, next steps. There is. Um, um, as Angie says, I, I personally feel something on the horns of a dilemma because we've had a series. We've taken this um, activity very diligently as you'd expect, and we've had a variety of styles and approaches to uh, the review. But there's always some reason, isn't there, why you're going to do something a little bit different, which I suppose is the reason the regulators have given us flexibility about how we go about it. And at this particular juncture, um, as Angie has said, it seems slightly daft not to be uh, making a judgment about how well led we are in respect of our ability to participate and play our full role as a system player. Um, so in raising that with the chair of the ICS, um, John MacDonald was very taken with that idea and is supportive of not a uh, not a, a single approach, obviously, but, um, you know, a little bit of coordination and um, an appropriate degree of synchronized swimming. And he was suggesting that perhaps, you know, the autumn might be the time because at that point there will be um, more practice and experience of the various system governance uh, groups and committees. So with them perhaps not fully bedded in, but at least established and up and running, um, you know, we will be able to kind of factor that into individual organisations thinking about a well-led in terms of readiness, preparedness and capability to engage at system level. So I think that's kind of where your recommendation has come out, Angie, um, in terms of maybe uh, that being the appropriate juncture for us to be uh, doing something. Just catching up with the chat, uh, we have something from Hal. Ah, very good, very good. Um, did you get any sense at the uh, review meeting about whether there was any expectation by the CQC as to whether we should be looking to do something before that kind of autumn timeline or not? No, no. Um, so. <laughs> and I picked up the um, question around system working last time with them and, and nothing directly from them. Um, but as Hal said, we, we did very clearly get that message across. Um, but I don't know whether Hal or Krishna have picked anything up either since or different vibes to me in that meeting. Uh, I, I didn't get any um, suggestion that they were changing their approach and, and their approach seemed um, a bit at odds with the recent consultation paper, that, which was suggesting a change in their approach, but the approach seemed very traditional to me. 
Yeah, well, I'm sure it'll take a while to kind of migrate uh, to the to the new ways of working. Well, on that basis, I think the proposal is on the basis that we had the um, we had the external, albeit peer review assessment in April um, 2020. Is that right? Yes, it would have been about then um, by the chief exec of Dorset Healthcare that we wouldn't do anything uh, before the autumn. And um, in the autumn, we would think about uh, whether our approach might be able to dovetail with that of other players in the system about looking not only at the trust in terms of well-led, but um, our uh, capability and capacity to play our full part in the system. Any comments or can I take a colleagues are content? I'm going to take it that everyone's content with that. Uh, approach. So thank you for that paper, Angie. Um, and that brings us back, if we may, to um, the good governance section of the agenda, which is item six, the Board Assurance Framework Summary. And I'm going to have a canter um, around each of the committee chairs, if I may, please, um, to update us and also to escalate any issues from the committees and in particular the integrated performance report and the review of the board assurance framework and risk registers and um, then I'll give you the last word Angie in terms of any um, perspective you want to give across that or any joining up so we go in the first instance to Mike please for um, audit and risk thanks Helen yeah we had a, a fully attended audit and risk committee on the 19th of January thanks everybody for for making time in, a, in what's a very busy agenda. It was much appreciated. Uh, I'll canter through the issues quite quickly because it was a fairly busy meeting. We had the, the counter fraud feedback that we're still in the red zone. We're still under review, but there were no specific actions or issues to report. Similarly on the anti-fraud process, uh, again, no specific actions or reviews, but constantly under review. In terms of internal audit, the follow-up rate is still low at 35% due to the pandemic, but I know Angie and Lee are working hard to get that up. and. We've got a dialogue with 360 to make sure that that doesn't jeopardise our head of internal audit opinion at the end of the year. In terms of external audit, uh, we heard that the new value for money standard is going to increase the workload and increase the fees. Uh, but nevertheless, we're on top of it. Uh, the accounts deadline has been put back to the 15th of June, but the finance team are very much hoping to get everything done by May. So that's pretty much business as usual on that front. We've looked at the trust risk report and noted the contents and remain pretty much as assured as we can be in that area, uh, given there's no such thing as, as full assurance, as we've discussed previously. In terms of internal audit, we uh, extended the contract for another two years from April 21 this year. Uh, I think everybody's happy with the service we're getting from 360. I am particularly impressed with what those guys do. And lastly, we have the debate around external audit where it looks like we're going to lose KPMG due to a conflict of interest because of the work they're doing on Joined Up Care Derbyshire. And I think we agreed that the, the new external audit appointment would probably potentially be a Joined Up Care uh, wide range audit appointment. So uh, that's, in, that's in the hands of the, of the system as well as the, uh, as well as the hospital. But uh, nothing really contentious, good meeting. We can't do in an hour and uh, we got a lot done because there's a lot of people on that committee who've been around for quite a while now and understand the issues and it was a, it was a productive meeting. Thank you, Mike. Um, in time on a tradition, we won't pause after each report. We'll uh, come back at the end. Um, also, Mike, if you might just also uh, tell us anything we need to know about DFSS in your oversight capacity. Yeah, sure. Uh, we had, a, again, another fully attended meeting on the 27th of January. Again, thank you for everybody making time. It's important. Three key issues were discussed, really, uh, on the risk management side, particularly around the focus on IT. The pandemic has clearly proved how stretched and, and dated our IT systems are, which we all know. Angie's been flying a flag quite uh, high and loud about making sure that we've got an IT uh, department and, and system that's fit for fit for process, sorry, fit for purpose, and not just in terms of standing still and perhaps stemming the, the flow of people out of the department, but making sure we've got a, a future-proof IT solution as best as we can, and some costs have been put together, and the IT guys and Lee and Angie are working how best we can fund that, but we've pretty much got the green light stroke instruction from Angie to just get on with it, which is great, and we are in the process of so doing. 
We're a little bit behind the curve on the CIP programme, again, mainly due to the issues around the pandemic. But some of the uh, some of the misses have been offset by a one off savings benefit. And we're continuing to look to drive those savings forward. I, I suspect there might be some slight miss at the end of the year, but perhaps you can update us a bit more on that when we do finances. But it's not a major problem, but just something to be mindful of. And as we're going to hear later from Dennis, the uh, the people survey with some excellent responses and some excellent results. So pretty much a good meeting. Again, the, the gelling between the uh, the subsidiary and the trust is strong, good communications both ways. And any fears I might have had 18 months ago about being a referee have absolutely failed to materialise. And it's, it was another good, productive meeting. Many thanks, Mike. Um, Alison, can we go to you for Finance and Assurance Committee, please? Uh, thanks, Helen. Um, so um, F&P met at the end of January and um, we concentrated the majority of our time on performance rather than finance. So just quick commentary on finance. We're on trajectory, um, as we would expect, both for Chesterfield and for the system. So um, you might want to invite Lee to make comment at the end of this discussion. Um, but uh, we spent the majority of our time on performance. Um, we went through the IPR um, and we also discussed restoration and recovery. Um, and um, as the board will understand, it's a developing situation all the time, balancing COVID response with other responses. Um, again, you might want uh, Angie and Berenice to give you some more detail, but um, very strong assurance from the committee and support for all the execs in, uh, in the difficulties of, of balancing the position. Um, and uh, we also uh, had a review of our committee performance. Um, so I, I don't particularly want to um, uh, push my own agenda, but uh, but it was a very positive review um, and we were happy with how the committee was performing. Um, so I'll leave you to draw in other people as you see fit. Have you um, changed the name of the committee? Because it used to be called the Finance and Performance Committee, and I noticed on the agenda is the Finance and Assurance Committee. Is that just a slip of the pen, or have you um, retitled yourselves? No, that's a slip of the pen. Pen. Finance Very, yeah. Very good. Please, please, I wasn't napping. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's fine. And we did review the BAF risks, but in recognition that the strategy is changing and there are some proposed new BAF risks, we haven't recommended any changes to any scores. Many thanks, Alison. Um, Jane, if we go to you for quality, uh, please. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, so we met on the 22nd of, of February. We had a very good meeting, some very positive feedback on the back of some changes to the quality report and the way that the items are presented to the committee. So that was really, really pleasing. Um, we had some quite meaty items that you've heard about before just to follow up. So um, first one I wanted to just draw your attention to was the infection control item about the hospital transmission of patient of COVID for our patients. Uh, we looked at, uh, we've got 20 cases where we are doing a further review. We looked at how that's going to happen and particularly talked about the involvement of the medical examiner and the oversight that the coroner has given to our processes and noted that the feedback from the coroner was very positive. Um, so there will be some further work coming on that. Um, I have to say um, that we've also had a review of infection control from NHSE and NHSI and um, with very positive feedback. So there is more information to come. Uh, and I'm sure that um, Jeremy, um, as a key member of that committee, uh, will be really scrutinising that information further and reporting upwards to board with myself if required. But we were we were very assured about the processes for examination of those cases. So I think just to take that away as a very, as a positive. And the second thing I wanted to talk about was um, the items on clinical outcomes. So we continue to review um, patients on the um, congestive cardiac fa failure pathway and thinking about the uh, what's caused us to have a mortality outlier, re outlier report on that and noting that that's related to palliative care and coding. So we expect to see that continue to be progressed and reported again at the next meeting. The next item on sort of clinical outcomes was around stroke. And again, we've had discussions about this at board. Um, really positive to say uh, that the action plan has really progressed well. And actually that the committee felt that we should change our focus from monitoring the action plan now to looking at the outcomes for patients as a result of those actions. Um, so we're very keen to receive information about the key metrics along the pathway. So 
for example, sensitive patients with uh, thrombolysis within the defined period and also the, um, the involvement of speech and language, etc. cetera. Um, we also noted that we still have some key risks around stroke, which relate to staffing. And I do expect there to be a further conversation with the board about the long term future of the stroke um, services in terms of hyperacute and system working, etc. So um, I think you'll see that coming to board in future. Um, I wanted to just say as well that we had a, a report from a presentation, actually, as well as report from um, Rachel Wyman on um, medicine and ED. Um, just highlighting their divisional assurance work and that was really really pleasing to see and actually it it really did show us the kind of the I talk about the golden thread between the board and right going down to the care units about the focus on quality and, and the things that people were really really um, actioning and really really thinking about so that was that was really good it's actually one of the more positive um steps that we've taken around kind of working with our divisional assurance colleagues so i think um that there's more to come on that but i think it, it, it just give us some sort of uh, positive news about divisional assurance and about ownership by the care unit so that that was really really good um in terms of maternity you know that the last meeting we reviewed the assurance report that we've submitted on ockenden and uh, this committee um most recent in february we actually approved the how will uh, maternity be visible? So where will you see it reported? Um, what will come to board? What will go through divisional assurance? What will go through quality assurance? And actually, that was just about putting all the pieces together of information um, to make sure, as I say, that we have full vis visibility of that. And, and as you know, you will see the metrics on a regular basis as a board through the um, uh, performance report. The very final thing that I wanted to say was we did just talk about risks. And actually, we noted that a number of the risks relate to cap capital projects. And we just asked about the connectivity, if you like, between movement on the risk register and how things feature in the, in the, cap in the capital programme for the coming year. So I know that that was taken away and, and was already something that was on people's minds. So I think that's quite an important thing for us to think about, particularly in respect of Ockenden and thinking about the environment in, a, in antenatal clinic. But also there were some risks related to breast clinic as well. So... Uh, I think, again, that, that was already in hand, but I think it was something that the committee needed to, to, to make your, bring to your attention. Um, I think that's all from Quality Assurance. Just to say, oh, so to say finally, we, in terms of our review of clinical effectiveness, most of the actions that we actually uh, took in terms of altering the way that items are presented to the committee, the way that we look at the quality report, the way the quality report is presented, actually were actioned for the first time through this committee. So that was a follow up from our clinical effectiveness review back by 360. So thank you. Thank you, Jane. Very comprehensive report and a very impressive amount of work by the committee. So thank you. Um, Jeremy, people, please. OK, thank you very much. Um, we had a people committee meeting last Wednesday. It was abbreviated. We slimmed it right down to just over an hour um, in light of the other calls on, on staff time. But nevertheless, it was, uh, I think, very useful. And the main thing we wanted to focus on, um, which I'll just expand the report a little bit on now, is about health and well-being of staff, which is obviously of paramount concern just at the moment. So just to expand a little bit on what's written down in today's paper, um, we heard uh, had updates on the various different uh, offers of support to, for health and well-being for staff at the moment. Um, as I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware, there are a range of different uh, offers there for staff. Um, one of the things that the People Committee is concerned to understand better is um, not only which of these offers are being taken up, but also which of them are perceived to be helpful. And um, because clearly, you know, when there are a range of offers, some will be good, some will be less good. Um, so we were very pleased to hear about conversations taking place with Hallam University colleagues uh, aiming to progress some evaluation of the, the different offers uh, that are there. Um, and we were particularly keen to, uh, well, we were hoping that though that would be progressed um, in, in fairly quick time, because uh, whilst it would be very interesting to know in two years' time what was helpful, 
it would be much better to know next week what's helpful because then we would know which which of the offers should be uh, expanded and which ones perhaps cut back on. So anyway, we, we, we heard about that. In terms of the actual offers that are there, um, I think you'll be aware of many of them. Uh, Derbyshire Healthcare uh, offering on-site counselling and high-level support for people who may, may be suffering P PTSD. Um, there's a, the support package from Ashgate Health Hospice, which is very, being very well received. Um, there's the Westfield Health Initiative, um, that's to say separately from the, the wellbeing, Health and Wellbeing Hub, which we know they're supporting, but the, the Westfield Health Project uh, is continuing. Um, and there's also support from some airline companies, for the provision of what they're calling wing, wingman experiences, first class land experiences and so on. And, and there are other offers on the table as well. Um, so we, we were very pleased to hear about that. There is a lot of plaudits given to Andy Pickin, who's the health and wellbeing lead. And in particular, um, I mean, he wasn't able to join us at the meeting, but if he had been, he would have been blushing red with embarrassment with the amount of compliments he, he was getting. Um, and it was particularly welcome that he'd been able to get around to divisional leadership teams and talk to them about uh, what's on offer. Um, so we were, we were overall very encouraged to hear about the extent of support being offered to staff um, at, at the moment in, in these difficult times and obviously that will need to continue uh, as, as we wind down from the present crisis. Um, apart from that, I think the rest of the report can be taken as read, but obviously I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, Angie, is there anything you'd like to add, kind of just taking two steps back and looking across the piece? I think it, it just summarises the, the introduction where we started in that huge amount of work that everyone's doing. So thank you to Ned colleagues for um, uh, for your reports and keeping the discussions and the support very live to, uh, to exec teams and their colleagues to be able to get on and do that huge amount of work in such difficult circumstances. Um, and the only uh, minor point I was going to add is that we haven't had any further feedback on the proposed BAF risks going forward. Um, so if everyone's OK, we'll start to do some work that link in where we're at now um, for next committees, because uh, we've got to that point where we're sort of hanging on uh, to review uh, BAF risks. So if that's OK with everyone, I'm happy to get approval for those or any final comments so we can move that forward. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Angie. Lots of nods to that, Angie. I think that's a splendid idea. We didn't talk about it specifically under the strategy item, but I think that the most clearly expressed uh, BAF risks I've ever had the pleasure of reading, and I'm sure they in turn will be a pleasure for committee chairs to work with. So I think it's a really good idea to, uh, you know, migrate uh, the whole uh, process in that direction now, because I think it's without prejudice to... Um, the extra bit of work we're going to do on clarity of milestones and the strategy. So, uh, yeah, very welcome and thank you for that prompt. Um, any questions or thoughts or comments on the back of those reports um, embracing both the BAF and the IPR? No? Okay. In which case, let us, I should probably just say at this juncture, we have had a couple of members of the public on the call, in addition to other guests who are on the uh, on the main number, um, governors and uh, such colleagues. Um, and we will, at the end of the meeting, um, give the opportunity for any questions that these observers might wish to uh, might wish to raise uh, because you're obviously very welcome observers. So if there's anything that's coming to mind on this item or others, you know, just hold on to it and uh, we will give you that opportunity as we get to the end of the meeting. Um, so just moving on now, please, if we may, we've done item seven, of course, the trust strategy. So we're straight through to item eight under the banner of engagement and item eight, the patient and staff experience report. Um, a duet from Krishna and Zoe. Um, I leave it to you to decide who goes first. Thank you, Helen. I'm going to kick off and then hand over to Krishna. Um, it's just a couple of things that I wanted to draw out from the pay from the staff experience perspective. Um, the um, so we've referenced the staff survey briefly so far today. We'll talk about it later in the um, private agenda. The embargo is the 11th of March. Uh, hospital leadership team and people committee at the most recent meetings we have talked about how we will communicate and cascade and involve local teams in the conversations about their own results. Um, so there are 
to say to board, there are plans in place about how we will do that and how the conversations will happen over the next few months um, in, in the context of how we're working at the moment. So we'll need to do things differently to how we've done them in the past, but it's still important that we um, share results with people and talk to them about what do we, where do we go from here? How do we amplify the good and look to make improvements on the things we might want to change together? So that's, so that's in hand and ready to go after the 11th of March. And the other thing that I wanted to draw out was around the Health and Wellbeing Guardian, um, which um, Jeremy has taken that role for us very, very, very ably. Um, we have had, had some information out now nationally and Jeremy has been on um, I think it was a webinar last month. Um, so the report does include the principles which have now been published, which Jeremy and I have spent some time going through together in terms of kind of where we think we are. Um, and so Jeremy taking a view on that and then some, some, some actions we could take to strengthen in some of the areas as well. So uh, that's, I will um, hand over to Krishna. Thank you very much. I just wanted just to draw attention to a couple of things, which is around sort of the national patient experience surveys, um, the majority of which were caused obviously for the majority of last year. So it's pleasing to see that we do have a planned schedule for coming forward for, for, for this year. It'll be really interesting sort of, you know, what our customers are actually saying about us to feed into that whole improvement with patient experience. Um, I think one of the other things that um, so our friends and family, uh, some of our responses in certain areas haven't been as high as we would like and that's a lot of it is when we've done some um, more deep dives around sort of the number of wards that have actually moved and wherever you've moved and we've got different teams moving, it just seemed to be that our processes that would normally be um, well established such as gathering friends and family data set has, has, has perhaps got lost so we've had to keep reinvigorating that. Um, just something else sort of on the horizon, we've talked a bit about what is our strategy going forward about um, gathering, pay, you know, more timely patient feedback um, and um, right the way across sort of pathways. Um, we'll hopefully be bringing to board next time, but we will be bringing to board sort of a potential solution to see about looking at pathways of care and getting more timely feedback. Um, and the patient story is perhaps a good example is if we'd have heard that feedback at the time from that gentleman, we may well have been able to put in some measures whilst he was actually in the hospital at the time instead of hearing his account uh, many months onwards. So it's about that timely intervention wherever possible and putting some measures in there. I think the other thing, I mean, you can see about the exec sponsorship sponsorship support and where we've made sort of inroads but over, overarching to that when I've spoken to those sort of the teams themselves they really do value that exec sort of oversight and engagement and a link into the board and feel that their concerns have been you know that they do feel sort of supported by us in those um, different sort of aspects that right the way across the organization so it was just really an over, overarching sort of feedback on um, how that's been received um, and you can see sort of by um, the paper where everybody has, has, has gone in and, and met and undertaken a various from listening events to um, different forums to hear sort of concerns or feedback or really positive things that people are doing. And actually, it's a two ways about sort of show, the area's been able to showcase as well. I think, I think that was everything I want to say, unless there's any other questions. Thank you very much, Zoe and Krishna. Um, very, very encouraging report. We didn't talk under the item on the Royal Academy of Improvement about areas that we're going to target in respect of our strategy for additional help and support by the Royal Academy. Um, but I know we have had those discussions more informally and I feel sure that, um, you know, this whole issue about real time patient experience has to be somewhere towards the, the top of that list. So we, uh, Look forward to further reports about progress in that regard, Krishna. Um, any comments or questions for Zoe or Krishna? No, well done both. Um, culmination of a lot of hard work and great evidence, um, if it was needed, of the extent to which, um, you know, colleagues are out and about and supporting those who are looking after our patients. Um, that brings us to um, any other business. So everything else now is either a consent item or a item for information. Um, so we will leave you to um, uh, note the information items. Um, our next meeting is on the 5th of May. 
um, as you'll be aware. So that leads us to the review of the meeting. Um, I would like to go, if I may, please, to um, some of our guests um, who are on the call um, about uh, how they found the meeting. Um, so I'm going to just uh, come to a few of you in turn and get ready. But just to say, um, uh, Gillian's obviously um, opening the bridge into the kind of uh, public viewing of this meeting. So if uh, members of the public do have any questions, uh, please put them in the questions section of your um, screen and uh, they will be passed on and we will deal with them before we uh, close the meeting. So um, now just going to colleagues. Uh, Eddie, if you're still on the line, tell us how how is it that the um how has the meeting been for you? Are you more <laughs> or less assured that the um that the trust is in good hands? No, it, it's 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 been very good for me. Uh, as I think, the session's very uh, interesting and useful, and you, you get that insurance that uh, you know it's been looked after well. So yes, thank you. Good, uh, Fiona. Lovely to see you on the call today. Um, any thoughts or feedback for us? Now, again, very uh, interesting and, um, yeah, and, you know, how, how well I think the trust is doing, considering that there's a pandemic and also, you know, a new white paper and having to kind of adjust to all of that, but also thinking really proactively about the future and what we can learn and take forward. And I really enjoyed that sort of patient <laughs> story thing. I think it's, um, yeah, that's a great way of understanding the experience. So, yeah, it's um, quite inspirational to 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 listen. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Lovely word. Um, Graham. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it. I'm still picking up the pieces, so to speak, or juggling the balls. I was interested about the patient uh, experience. Um, I've not sampled, and I hope I don't, um, Chesterfield's hospitality. I've done it as a day page, uh, daycare unit for a couple, but never experienced the wards. So I'd be interested to see the layout and what's done. Um, the ones I've achieved, you know, um, mainly Hammersmith Hospital, and you've got about 20 students with the consultant. So, you know, how you keep that discreet and quiet in some of the wards, I'm not sure you know, but it's something, yeah, we need to look at because some people are sensitive, um, you know, and it's it's the experience of everything. Um, so, yeah, very good and uh, pleased with how things are going and it seems very good and very switched on. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, <laughs> Judith. Yes, actually, most unusually for me, I've got very little to say, which is remarkable. But yes, it feels um, the the trust feels very, very safe. And I that I have made a comment that it's yet again, it's just this sort of atmospheric change in how the language of the meetings and the feeling that there's so much integration between the people on the front line and the board and indeed um, the non-execs making sure that the, the board are held if uh, I know Helen often says you know had their feet over the fire I think that's it isn't it Helen there was only just one observation <coughs> excuse me choking myself I don't know whether it was something Angie raised um, I'm reluctant to say a red flag because it should be a blue and white flag of course but I think it was in one of her reports it I might have misheard it, which is quite possible, <coughs> but it was something like in all that you're doing and all the, the forward planning, did I hear this awful, these awful words planning for a third wave? Um, and, you know, I am reluctant to make too much of that, given the situation we're in. But I, I, I would dislike to say that must be a huge drain on the stuff and that's all I'm going to leave it with. But thank you. Well, we need to be realistic, don't we, as well as optimistic. So uh, thank you for those yeah. words, Judith. Mm -hmm. And we've had a guest star appearance today by um, Denise Varemchuk. Lovely to have you back around the <laughs> table again, Denise, so yeah. to speak. Um, how, how, how have you found it? Um, I, I found it really useful. Um, I thought the Royal Academy annual report was excellent. 
um, being part of being a governor before all that started and the actual divisional examples I thought were really really good um, I've enjoyed the meeting as Judith said I thought it was very positive it's good to hear the numbers are coming down regarding Covid um, but yes very very insightful really good meeting Excellent. Thanks, Denise. And um, thanks for making the time to be here. So I hope I haven't missed any of our guests. Um, but just to open it up more generally to the board, anything anybody would like to add? No, you're probably thinking about getting a cup of tea in advance of us um, reconvening to do some um, uh, sensitive business. So um, I'm going to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been on the call and to the board for their usual um, preparation and high quality participation and um, a reminder that um, our May meeting will be uh, broadcast in the same way and um, all comers are welcome. So very many thanks and I will see my board colleagues again shortly. Thank you. Bye for now.